What up, guys? It's Grooming for here. <clears throat> Back with another episode. And I got another important informational topic to bring to you guys. If you haven't realized that my channel is more on information and small product reviews, I, you, you should realize it by now. I, I'm not focused on silly bong rips and bong ripping contests and how to build a cheap plastic bong out of a two liter pop bottle. That's not what my channel is about. I'm here to bring you information and education on cannabis. Because in general society that's very lacking. <laughs> and today I want to bring you a topic about cannabis harm reduction. And I know you're thinking, well there's generally low harms within cannabis, but th there are some harms and there are ways that we can reduce those harms. And there are certainly some people that shouldn't necessarily be using cannabis and we need to bring that information out there because within society we're, we're usually be taught only drug abstinence that one drugs are bad two don't do drugs and that's all you're taught but we need to teach ways of harm reduction for those that use substances but they still want to reduce the harms within it. And that's very important. And of course today I'm going to bring you information from the pot book. Let's see. And this is a chap chapter written by um, Andrew Tatarski. Tur Tatarski. PhD. And I'll bring you another, another uh, chapter by another doctor. And if, if you want to learn more information about the pot book, I'll post a link down below on their website. And you can, of course, go to your local head shop and buy a copy. If they don't have it, demand that they stock it, because this is a very important book. And, of course, within the book, when it says marijuana, I always say cannabis, because that's the proper name. Cannabis has been charged with the power to induce insanity and proposed as the gateway to all things evil addiction, violence, sexual depravity. It's thought to be the most benign and least addictive psychoactive substance, able to ease the symptoms of a wide variety of illnesses. Is, is marijuana harmful or not? Who decides and how? What has your experience been? If you're concerned about your own use, this chapter will help you answer these questions and create a healthy relationship to cannabis. I will dis discuss the potential harms associated with cannabis and offer some tips for minimizing them. Also described as a framework for creating a healthy relationship to cannabis. This approach has evolved from my work with patients and colleagues over, over the more than 30 years that in, informed my understanding of why substance use becomes problematic for some and how others make positive changes in their use. Harm reduction philosophy frames and influences the approach. An integration of strategies to deep depth and Deepen the awareness and facilitate change provides a variety of tools to use in your own process. This chapter is written prim primarily for recreational and medical users and their families and friends, but others will find the framework useful for addressing other potential problematic behaviors such as other substance use. Oops. Eating problems, excessive working, computer games, and internet use. All substance use must all substance users must discover for themselves what their healthiest, most self-affirming relationship is to substances. In part, th this entails separating one's own experience from ideology about cannabis. Cannabis is a benign psychoactive substance for many, but it can have serious negative consequences for others. The challenge for the user is to find a relationship to cannabis that maximizes the potential benefits while minimizing the negative consequences and potential risks. This may mean smoking less, using more safely, using for different reasons, instituting a different pattern of use, or stopping altogether. While stopping may be the best way to reduce the risk and negative consequences of using cannabis, it is not an answer for everyone. Many concerned cannabis users are not ready, willing, or able to stop. They need an alternative approach that starts where they are. Harm reduction. Harm reduction is an alternative to the traditional abstinence-only approach to, to problem substance use. 
It began as a response to the failure of traditional treatment to address the explosion of serious drug and alcohol use in Amsterdam and Liverpool in the 1970s. The essence of harm reduction philosophy is, is the acceptance of the fact that people use mind-altering substances. The focus is shift from only trying, trying to stop drug use <clears throat> to, re to reducing the harms associated with substance use, acknowledging abstinence as one among many possible ways to accomplish this. Harm reduction seeks to, seeks to support and empower users to make conscious, responsible, healthy choices regarding their drug use and other aspects of their lives. All positive changes, small and large, are considered successes. The research on cannabis-related harm is generally in agreement. The public health risks are small. In my own practices over the years, the percentage of people I've seen who sought help, problem, help for problems with cannabis is small relative to other drugs. However, cannabis can lead to serious consequences and every user should know how to reduce the chances of encountering them. I need some coffee. Another drug that we use every day, caffeine. And why not take a small bong rip? I guess I just defeated the purpose of my hemp wick holder. <coughs> Acute harms are the most common negative outcomes associated with cannabis. They occur while the user is intoxicated and generally don't last long when the drug, drug effect wears off. Negative psychological reactions. Negative psychological reactions include anxiety, paranoia, a feeling of losing touch with reality, feeling stupid, and being flooded with troubling thoughts. Some of these are more likely to occur for inexperienced users, such as those just beginning and those with a very, very low tolerance. That could mean somebody smoking for two or three years, but they only smoke once in a while, so they still do have a low tolerance. The potency of marijuana, of cannabis, however, varies widely. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped it. Skipped it. Tip one. If you are feeling overwhelming or terrifying feelings such as paranoia or in intense disorientation, sit tight and remember they will pass soon. Cannabis is a drug that will never cause an overdose and it will not cause serious bodily harm if you take too much. Just relax. Just know that it's it's okay. You you can let, you can lay down and have a nap. That's the best way. <laughs> The potency of cannabis varies widely. When you are unfamiliar with a certain strain of cannabis, it is always good to start with a very small amount and wait 10 minutes to see how strong it is. A good, a good device to use for testing this is a one-hitter. It kind of looks like a cigarette. I have a video for a review. I'll post right here or something or whatever. And it, you only take one small hit. And this is awesome for testing out strains, for different flavors, different potency. And really good for uh, low low tolerance cannabis users that just want a small toke. Don't mix cannabis with other drugs that can intensify negative effects, such as drinking alcohol, popping pills. Don't do that. You tip four: use in a safe place with trusted friends. This is very important, and this can seriously reduce the effects of paranoia. When you know you're in a safe place, in a safe environment, with safe friends, you know that nothing is going to happen, that you're going to be alright, that you don't have to be paranoid or anxious that anything is going to happen. This is very important to inexperienced users. People with severe, oh, tip five, people with severe mental illness should be aware that cannabis might cause psychotic episodes. A small percentage of people experience a loss of the normal sense of self or reality that can linger well beyond drug use. Some research has suggested that cannabis may cause schizophrenia to emerge in vulnerable people. The safest measure with this group of people is to avoid cannabis. If you are in this group and choose to use despite this risk, go with tip one. 
and you, I'll, I'll talk more about schizophrenia and cannabis in another episode. It's, it's very undecided about this, that subject. Dysfunctional thinking. Thinking can be disturbed, particularly, particularly in the areas of learning, attention, concentration, memory, and time sense. Activities that depend on these functions can be disrupted. <clears throat> so, of course, avoid using cannabis before activities that require intact cognitive function, such as going to going, such as smoking weed before work, such as smoking weed before school, or a big event that you have to do. And this is especially for the inexperienced users, and even for the experienced users. If you do if you do smoke too much, you may cause paranoia within yourself. Impaired motor response. Motor impairment and slowed reaction time increases the risk of accidents while driving and using machinery. Do not drive and operate dangerous machinery while high. Also, be aware that they may be a hangover effect the day after heavy smoking. And this is most commonly called a burnout. You're very lethargic, very slow, very chill. Chronic harms. Chronic harms are the negative effects from negative effects that result from long-term cannabis use. Cannabis dependency syndrome does occur in some users. Some research estimates that about 10% of people who have ever tried cannabis meet dependency criteria. The hallmarks of dependency are compulsion, craving, the sense of loss of control, continuing to use in spite of negative consequences, tolerance, and withdrawal. Common negative effects I have seen are diminished effects at work or school, problems with intimacy, social withdrawal, self-esteem problems, feeling like a stoner. It actually says that. It's interesting. Disruptive creativity and feeling bad about the sense of dependence itself. These risks increase as frequency and length of use increase. People often wonder if one can become dependent on something that is reportedly not physically addictive. If you consider that the effects of mar that cannabis are caused in part by its impact on brain chemistry and functioning, and that dependence is related to biology, psychology, and social context, then it becomes easier to understand why chronic use of cannabis can lead to dependency. Any drug that is used for positive effects can become can come to be relied on upon these effects and so lead to the experience of dependency. The social and other external factors usually connected to using can become strong triggers for the urge to use. All these factors may, be, may become in unique ways for each person to contribute to a growing sense of dependency. Identifying these factors can lead to steps you can take to develop a more controlled, moderate, and ritualistic relationship to cannabis, or to determine if it's best to stop altogether. Tip 1. You might commit to breaking your current dependent relationship to cannabis and attempt to develop a different, less intense and harmful pattern of use. Some people find that they can, while others find that attempting a less harmful relationship is too difficult to, to too difficult or practi practically impossible and decide to stop altogether. Tip 2. Be as clear and specific as you can with yourself about what changes you would like to make in, in frequency and amount as a goal to work towards. Tip, tip 3. Decide on an approach to making the, this change. Many people find that it is easiest to take a 30 day break from, from cannabis before attempting to institute a new pattern of use. This enables the system to clear out the THC, reduce tolerance, and get over the discomfort of withdrawal that some people feel when stopping. Some prefer a weaning approach that is small steps towards the new pattern, while others prefer picking a date and making the changes all at once. See what feels most appealing to you and give it a try. Tip 4. Monitor urges for using and try to sit with them. Urge surfing. Putting time and space between the urge and what you choose to do about it, to smoke or not smoke, cuts the habitual aspect of dependency and supports a new, more conscious relationship to using. Tip 5. 
Dialogue with the urge. Ask yourself if this is the moment to use that is in accord with your new goals and relationship to using. Tip 5. I just read tip 5. Tip 6. Uh, review your reasons for deciding to make a change. Try to stay connected to your motivation. Tip 7. Identify what seems to be triggering the, the urge to use and consider different strategies for addressing, managing, or expressing your triggers. Triggers can be internal, such as feelings and emotions, or external, such as particular people, things, or events. Possible alternatives are yoga as another way to relax and meditation as another way to let go of the world of your of responsibility. Tip 8. Behavior... Behavior change requires hanging in with a process, changing complex habitual ways of being. One way to think of dependency is usually low and gradual, happening in small steps, rarely a straight line. As with any ha habit, you are working with a part of you that wants to hold on to the new, wants to hold on to the old way of being. Try to be patient, forgiving, preserving, and hopeful. Abnormal thought patterns. Thinking can be disrupted. While a general decrease in attention, memory, learning, and organization that can be quite troubling. Try tip one. Try using smaller amounts and less often. Tip two. Take days or weeks off to reduce the THC buildup in your system. Tip three. Don't use the night or day before an appointment or a new challenge. And lung problems. Problems such as lung congestion, coughing, chronic bronchitis, and precancerous changes are related to smoking. Water pipes may send high concentrations of tar to the lungs because of the tendency to hold the smoke in longer. These effects are compounded when tobacco is mixed with cannabis. And normally in the States, you don't mix tobacco and weed in a bowl, but it's very common in the UK. And in small amounts, they do use it in the U.S., and it's called, they like to call it poppers, what I've heard. Alright, tip one. Eating cannabis products or drinking cannabis tea to eliminate smoking-related harms. This will require patience, because effects come on slowly. It is also harder to gauge the amount you are taking this way, and the effects can last longer and be much more intense than with smoking. Exercise extreme caution with, with the amount you eat until you know how powerful the preparation is. So this can be done by making cannabis edibles, by making the can of butter, or you can also make a tincture which is used with alcohol or vegetable glycerin. I have a link here on my video on how to make can of butter and maybe in the future I'll do a video on how to do a vegetable glycerin tincture which is actually really awesome. If you must smoke, don't mix, mar don't mix cannabis with tobacco. Tip 3. Don't inhale deeply or hold the smoke long. Deep inhalation won't get you significantly won't get you significantly more stone, but it will del deliver much more carbon monoxide to your brain. Tip four: Vaporizing is a good alternative to smoking cannabis. Vaporizers heat rather than burn the material. This process releases the THC and other cannabinoids without the toxic products of burning the plant material. Tip five. Higher potency cannabis can reduce the amount you smoke, but be careful to, the, to smoke a smaller amount to reduce the risk of negative psychological effects because you have to titrate that very carefully because you can take a, take a larger dose than what you expect with concentrates and this is very apparent for new users and of course infectious diseases. Um, infectious diseases are Infectious diseases that are passed in saliva, like spinal meningitis, can also be spread through the sharing of smoking implements. Don't share bongs or pipes, and if you do share, don't let the joint touch your lips, and that's the same with the pipe or a bong. And of course, I'll cover a topic that I get a lot of heat from, and this is in part of harm reduction, but holding hits and smoking resin. And this section is written by Dr. Mitch Earlywine, PhD. Uh, 
holding hits. An additional strategy for reducing respiratory problems associated with smoking cannabis concerns the length of time users keep smoke inside their, in their, inside their bodies. The common habit of holding smoke in their lungs for long periods likely increase tar deposits, which un undoubtedly add to respiratory problems. Although many experience, experienced users swear by this habit, two studies reveal that holding hits longer does not create greater chances in mood, create, create greater changes in mood. Let's make more coffee. <laughs> and if the video is too lengthy for you, I don't care. I, I want to be in depth with my information so you can get the full information and education. And of course, smoke a bowl, sit down, chill, take take in some information. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Announcing this result in large crowds has gotten me pelted with objects. So let please. So please let me provide some details. Re researchers had marijuana smokers take a hit and either blow it out immediately or hold it up, hold it in for up to 20 seconds. Holding hits did not create a larger impact on mood. Unfortunately, it did increase the amount of carbon monoxide in their lungs. Holding hits after smoking placebo cannabis did create a lightheaded, dizzy experience of consciousness easily confused with cannabis's effects. In short, any extra high associated with holding hits probably stems from simply holding one breath. Users are more committed to holding their breath should probably exhale the cannabis smoke first. Otherwise, exhaling soon after inhaling should produce identical s subjective experiences with markedly less potential for respiratory injury. So that means if you want to hold, if you want that extra buzz from holding in your breath, of holding in your toke, take your bong rip, exhale after three seconds, and then once your lungs are fully exhaled, hold your breath, and you'll still get that lightheaded effect. And you can get that lightheaded effect without the carbon monoxide. Try it out for it. And resin. The resinous glands of the marijuana of the cannabis plant can be rich in cannabinoids. The black residue that remains in smoking instruments after continued use is also known as resin. Because heat destroys cannabinoids, it is unlikely that this resin is psychoactive. Nevertheless, many users swear that smoking this substance creates a psychoactive effect. Anecdotal evidence such suggests that users turn to this substance when cannabis is not available. And I will admit, I will admit, I used to smoke resin when I was a kid, when I didn't have weed. I, I smoked resin as well. But now that I've learned the dangers of it, I've stopped. And my lungs are thanking me. It's, it's just common sense now. That after you've learned, you can't go back. And, of course, I would rather smoke actual cannabis. Like, I would, I would rather wait and then smoke cannabis, then smoke resin, and have that terrible taste, and that terrible, disgusting look and mess in your bowl. It's, it's gross. <laughs> Although no published data addresses the issue, this habit could be extremely detrimental given the exposure to heat and burn material. The amount of tars and black residue lining smoking apparatuses is likely much higher than in cannabis and it appears to require high temperatures to release smoke. Its THC content is also likely to be small. Increased availability of cannabis as well as education on the potential drawbacks of this behavior may help decrease the prevalence of this problematic habit. And I, I've gotten quite a lot of heat from a lot of cannabis users about this topic. And I want to make it clear I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm bringing out information so you all can learn. So we can all make informed decisions on cannabis. Because constantly we are rained down by government propaganda and their false studies and their bullshit. 
And this book is filled with factual information. It produces the, the positive information on cannabis and the negative harms that we should be aware about. And that's what my channel is about, bringing out information, because that's what we need to do. We not only need to inform ourselves, but we need to inform the public, because they're the most uninformed. They take, they look at cannabis and they think it's just a drug. It's not. It's a plant. It's an herb. It's a medicine. It's a recreational benefit for some. It's a beautiful plant. And... We need to put this information out there as much as possible so nobody can be confused by it. So propaganda isn't as powerful as it is. Because like I keep saying, this is the age of the information. We have everything at our fingertips. And I, I know you, you could easily be choosing to watch a bong ripping video or a hot chick smoking weed. But hey, there's also cannabis information out there. We need to medicate and educate. That's what this channel is all about. So if you, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope you have a great day, guys. Peace. Stay medicated, and stay educated.